Um, I just want to introduce our final keynote, uh, kind of wrapping it up for us uh, today. Uh, and I'm really honored once again to invite Nithya Rupp to, to, to speak for us here at the symposium. Um, of course, ev everybody knows Nithya, so it's hard to not, <laughs> I don't even know if I need to introduce you, but I will. Um, she is the head of the Amazon Open Source Program Office, and uh, she drives open source culture and coordination inside of Amazon and engagement with external communities. Um, uh, she has guided, uh, sorry, Amazon is guided by its leadership principles, including customer obsession. Oh, sorry, I'll go over, I'll spit so far, sorry. Yes. <laughs> so before Amazon, of course, she was also uh, worked in open source programs at Comcast and Western Digital. And uh, and uh, she also worked for, as, as the, uh, she's also uh, currently the chair of the um, Linux Foundation board. Even more importantly to us, she's a member of our advisory board, <laughs> and so and that's and we really appreciate all of the work. And she's also the member. Uh, she's also the advisor to the um, Open RIT, who was Stephen was talking earlier, and maybe the other groups or just it's two. It's two I think it's just two. Yeah. Um, and Lith Nithia is really passionate about uh, um, about open source, about diversity, a lot of the stuff that we've been talking today about. And I can go on and on because she's got a great, uh, she's got so many things she's done um, in her career. And um, and uh, those of us who are working open source, especially women, uh, see her as a great mentor and a, a great uh, role uh, to follow, um, a role model to follow. So uh, without further ado, um, we all want to hear what Nithya has to say and not necessarily from what I have to say. So thank you great. so much, Stephanie. And it's, it's fantastic to be at UC Santa Cruz in person. I think the last time I was here was when Carlos invited me to speak. I think it was, gosh, about five, six years ago. And I was so sad that we couldn't meet in person last two years. And thank you for uh, really doing such a fantastic job, Stephanie, of a hybrid event, you know, including people across the board. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, the topic that I want to talk about is the history of open source, but with an open source program office lens. You know, how did open source program offices come into being? What do they do? And what is the future of these open source program offices? So let me um, get started. I think uh, many of you are familiar with these symbols, uh, GNOME, FSF, GPL. And this was the 80s and 90s. And I think Tony Wasserman uh, messaged me last time I gave this talk saying you should also include BSD. And he's right, Berkeley was one of the uh, predecessors of what we know today as open source software. So in the 80s and 90s, most of open source was really a community thing. And it was uh, started by uh, individuals and it was uh, free as in freedom. So Richard Stallman was really trying to break the, um, the, the way open source software was created in those days, which was very, very proprietary. You could not see the source code. You could not examine uh, the source code or distribute it or use it for various different purposes. And he was struggling with a printer that he could not customize and use for his uh, you know, lab. And so he wrote the new license, uh, the GNU public license, which granted the freedoms to developers to be able to uh, do all those things, you know, examine the code if they wanted to, customize it if they wanted to, use it anywhere, distribute it anywhere. Um, and that really completely changed the landscape of how software was written and how it was spread and how it was uh, consumed. But, but it, it was important to note that there, there's very little formal organization involvement at this time, uh, meaning you know, big institutions or companies or universities, maybe universities because of Berkeley and you know, some of uh, MIT and things of that nature. But there wasn't formal engagement with open source software during these days. And that's important from an OSPO perspective. Um, then you start seeing in the 90s, the start of company engagement. So you start seeing companies uh, beginning to have Linux come into their uh, back doors through system administrators. 
using it as sprint drivers and you know other kinds of drivers in the uh, in in the IT shop. Um, and companies start acknowledging that my gosh, this is a real thing, and we need to kind of understand what this is and how to deal with it. Um, three important elements of this uh, 1990s is uh, Linus using GPL and also uh, kind of putting his kernel out there and saying, hey, does anyone want to work with me on this? Does anyone want to help me develop this? And I think the use of the license was an important element of how quickly uh, you know, his product spread or his, his project spread and people got involved and the pace of innovation of uh, the kernel um, and the breadth and depth of you know, usage of the kernel uh, today is uh, a huge part, I think, that because of the license that he used. And the second uh, institution that really came into being at this time was the Open Source Initiative. And it came into being to uh, really look at licenses, curate licenses, uh, make sure that the open source definition was defended uh, and the freedoms were defended and you really were curating licenses based on this definition. Um, and, and the word open source also came into being during this time, a woman by the name Christine Peterson, um, seeing that companies were fearful of the word free in the free and open source software, uh, coined the term open source. Uh, because it, it really was descriptive of what it was, and companies weren't so fearful of it. Um, companies were fearful of the economic fee. They felt that it meant then that they would have to give things away, or they couldn't see the business model or the monetization around you know, how open source would work, and so they were fe fe fearful of the word free. Companies have individuals or groups at this time, at this point in time, starting to look at open source. Um, Dan Fry, for example, at IBM, and then Intel was also one of the early groups, uh, OTC, which started looking at how do we work with this thing called open source. And many of these companies started something called open source development labs, whose uh, whose really purpose was to um, make you know, Linux more enterprise ready and more mission critical and more usable in products and more mature uh, as, a, as a software. Then you continue to see the rise of, you know, foundations around open source. And this is, this is a, a kind of a signal of the maturing of open source, if you will. Um, the Apache Foundation was started around this time in the late 90s, 98, 99, I think. Um, again, because they had uh, the Apache server and they had uh, a lot of projects evolving and they needed to have a more formal home uh, where they could care for these projects and they could create more formal practices around community uh, around how you know people could contribute to this, how they govern this project, and also create more trust in the community around uh, a neutral home and the fact that you know there was there was this formal organization caring for it. Um, the Apache is a 501c3 institution, which is a nonprofit, so almost everybody there is a volunteer, and they chose to set it up in that fashion. At the same time, the Linux Foundation came into being. Um, Linux Foundation was a merger of OSDL, which was the open source development labs that was started by some companies and free standards group. And the LF decided to in, you know, be a 501c6, which is more of a trade association because they started seeing that companies were interested in how open source evolved and and wanted to also create an organization which could house uh, someone like a Lena Storvalds as a fellow. Um, if Linus kind of got into one of the companies, then you can see that he could be influenced by that company's agenda. And because uh, the whole world was starting to use Linux and depend upon Linux, it was important to have uh, you know, Linus in a neutral home like the Linux Foundation. And so Linux Foundation started with Linux as the project, the kernel, and 
Linus, but of course now it is a very broad umbrella organization with uh, using what it's learned in um, curating and caring for the Linux kernel um, across lots of other industries. So you start seeing um, companies like IBM, Sun, HP, uh, SGI start to um, create, you know, open source program office kind of uh, organizations. A Sun had a program office during the times of Simon Phipps and uh, Denise Cooper and others. And their, mon their really role was uh, to help the business units across the company, um, you know, set up open source projects or uh, create products based on open source product projects and, and to really advance the state of open source across the company. Uh, open Office, for instance, at Sun. And then you, you also see IBM donating $1 billion to uh, open source. And all of these actions really formalized and legitimized uh, open source in many ways in corporate America. Because if IBM is backing open source, no one ever fires you for buying IBM, right? And so uh, it, it made it very important. And, and you start seeing Eclipse Foundation coming into being and other things which uh, really created more trust in open source and created more formal company engagement. All of this led to a perfect storm um, in the late 90s, early 2000s, when um, a lot of hyperscale companies were born. And a lot of these companies were born in the age of open source. So the Yahoo's, the Google's, the Amazon's, the Netflix's, and they had such perfect conditions to scale and grow because there was a lot of open source software around. Um, there were standards-based servers from Intel x86 servers um, that were plentiful. And so they could start building the building blocks for their data centers and start building things at scale. And one of the things they did, which was also very beneficial to open source was that they started contributing back the projects that they had built inside their data center to scale or to do things at production grade. So Cassandra came out at this time, uh, Hadoop, Map, Reduce, um, the Go language, uh, so many other, and Netflix says Spinnaker, and so many, um, you know, at scale projects came out. So not only could the hyperscalers use these um, massive, uh, solutions, but now anyone could, you know, use these solutions to build at scale. This was also an interesting time because uh, the to-do group actually came into being at this time, and Carlos referred to the to-do group. And this was a private group that uh, some of these hyperscalers set up. I think Twitter's Twitter, um, uh, you know, Box and. Um, Google and Facebook, it was kind of a back channel so that they all could discuss, how are you doing this? Or uh, what are your best practices for doing compliance? Or how are you building community around your project? Or I'm dealing with this issue, um, you know, which license should be used and so on and so forth, right? It was, it was meant to be uh, all of these companies helping each other grow up and, and use open source and best practices around open source. So this was started, I think, sometime in 2014, 15. I remember um, seeing the announcement of the to-do group when I was at SanDisk and saying, hey guys, can I join? And it wasn't open to anyone. Uh, so nobody answered me. It was kind of complete silence. And then I remember going to, um, I believe it was GitHub Universe, and um, the Linux Foundation brought Chris Anischeck and others and said, can we make this more of a neutral organization so other companies can learn from you and you know, build at scale and, and really create OSPOs at scale? And so you find uh, that we tend to, we, uh, I think it was 2016, 17, it migrated over to the Linux Foundation. And then they focused on how can we create best practices around OSPOs. And you know, earlier it came up uh, around academia. The to-do group started 
from companies, as you can imagine. So that's why it has a very company flavor, but there's every intention to be um, more broad, including academia and maybe other verticals. And so, um, you know, as you build critical mass in academia or in public sector or other areas, I can see subgroups emerging, uh, which include, you know, specific practices for those particular OSPOs. So, I mean, it, the cloud builds on open source. I was just talking to Alex at a break and cloud companies could not uh, evolve and work today if it hadn't been for open source. Let's face it, the very fabric of data centers uh, at Amazon or Google's cloud or Microsoft or any other cloud is really built upon open source. Um, and the early days of AWS also, a lot of open source was used. And the early OSPO, though it wasn't called an OSPO at AWS started around 2006, 2007. And as you can imagine, it was started with more compliance in mind. Uh, we are using all this open source. We better be compliant. We better you know, make sure we know what licenses mean, how to use them, and what to do if we distribute product outside the company. And so it was more uh, educational plus compliance, working very closely with the legal team. But since then, uh, open source has really, really grown uh, at companies. And I'll discuss the maturity chart that the uh, to-do group uh, publishes, which talks more about what are the different stages companies go through. But my own experience at AWS and, and Amazon in general is you'll always find, and perhaps in universities also, you'll always find various levels of maturity across the organization. There'll be some very super mature groups in the company, and there'll be some very immature groups. And our job at the OSPO is to very intentionally um, bring everyone you know, up to more maturity. And following the uh, cloud, uh, you start seeing you know, companies like Capital One and Fannie Mae and Comcast and Target uh, realizing very quickly that they need to go digital or else uh, you know, they have no business. And so a lot of enterprises in lots of different businesses start adopting open source, start using open source, start becoming software companies. And my history at Comcast is, you know, Comcast used to buy a lot of proprietary products from vendors and just stand them up and just operate it. And very soon they realize not only because of digital competition, but because the customers wanted um, very rapidly evolving experiences and they wanted new features functions really quickly, they could not depend upon vendors who had you know, one year roadmaps and they had to wait until the vendor delivered the feature before they could offer it to their customers. So they needed to get ahead of software themselves. They needed to start developing uh, applications. They start, needed to start developing the infrastructure in the company themselves. So Comcast started their op open source division and started um, hiring software developers. But when you are a company that's not known for open source or for software development in general, it's really hard to compete with the Googles of the world and the Amazons of the world for talent. And so open source became another way of displaying the work that they did, the innovative work that they did by open sourcing the projects and attracting good developers into the company. It was also a way to uh, brand themselves as technology companies. So you'll find that a lot of enterprises will uh, do open source program offices to be out in the public, to demonstrate the thought leadership, um, to also recruit. But frankly, they're also doing very innovative work in their field, uh, whether it's media and entertainment or movie making or uh, other areas. So you find that enterprises now are starting OSPOs as well. So if you look at the to-do group uh, map on the website, you'll find certainly all the technology companies, but you'll find a ton of enterprises in various uh, stages of adopting OSPOs. 
And um, it's, it's a big thing. And, and each OSPO needs to do what's right for its particular organization. Um, every organization has a different business mission and a business objective. So the OSPO really fits into uh, what that company is all about. And, and as someone mentioned, I think Stephen uh, from RIT mentioned, open source sometimes can be too limiting because open is all about data, science, hardware. And so you find that uh, that's why the Linux Foundation is really also helping open data, open hardware organizations use the techniques, the frameworks, the constructs that they've created for uh, you know, hosting open source projects to other industries like data and like hardware. And you find other uh, verticals also uh, using open source ways of collaboration and open uh, collaboration, open um, invention, problem solving, whatever you can think of, community coming together to solve common problems that they all face. So agriculture is one of the new foundations, um, energy, and then you certainly can see uh, uh, LF Health, which has been looking at uh, COVID-19 uh, and how do you share contact tracing apps across nations, across states, across companies. So the, the foundations have found a way to create a neutral home to uh, house legal uh, aspects of the project, copyrights and, and help uh, advise the project of those things. They also have found a way to create governance around a project and maybe fundraising, marketing events. So when you move a project into a foundation, whether it's Apache or Eclipse or Linux Foundation, you have uh, people who are skilled in helping you kind of house that and find a neutral home, if you will, for the project. And many companies do that because uh, sometimes if you house it just in your GitHub, like Comcast's GitHub or Amazon's GitHub, you may not get as broad a participation uh, from your competitors and perhaps from others who think that you, quote, own the project or uh, you benefit from the project and it's not a neutral project. And open source in public sectors is, is becoming really big. And, and as Saeed was mentioning, OSPO++ really helps a lot of public sectors uh, learn from each other and create um, open source program offices. The World Health Organization had an ad out, I think about six months ago or a year ago, looking for an OSPO leader. And they worked with GitHub to kind of construct the job description and the, and the uh, focus, if you will, of the WHO's um, OSPO. And then you, you'll find amazing policies written in the EU, in France and, and Germany, around how they want to approach open source and how they're measuring the effect, the monet monetary value, if you will, of open source to their countries. Because uh, governments have to care about citizenry, but they also have to care about attracting talent. They also have to care about development of industry in their countries. And so open source has been that glue, if you will, to establish uh, connections to all these constituents and also be transparent and trustworthy. And then you find um, open source in academia, which was so, so well covered uh, by uh, the panel before. Uh, the orange symbol is RIT. I think Stephen was here. Um, I think Saeed can cover Johns Hopkins and Carnegie Mellon and certainly cross and, and I forgot the symbol for the new OSPO at UC that I needed to add. And they're being guided by a couple of major institutions. Um, I think it's, it's valuable to have both. You can learn some things from corporate, but you know, frankly, you also need to collaborate with companies and public sector. So these two organizations have really helped uh, increase the level of knowledge and collaboration across these uh, organizations. The uh, uh, to-do group puts together 
um, this diagram, which is about maturity of OSPOs and the different stages of maturity. And what you'll find here is that, let me read it. Um, one of the first things that happens is you discover that there is use in your organization. Um, people are using it and people are adopting it. And, and you know, I think uh, Saeed or someone else mentioned curation becomes one of the big tasks. So who knows open source in the company? Where are they in their maturity? What, who's using it? Who's put, put open source out? And, and so that becomes one of the first things. The second aha becomes, oh dear, I need to now worry about licenses. And I need to understand what licenses are okay for my organization, what are not. And um, also if I distribute, what do I need to do? So compliance becomes an extremely important thing. And so we start working very closely with legal. We also start um, educating and creating a policy around open source for the company. And you start uh, educating, for instance, at Comcast and also at Amazon, um, we have mandatory training for software engineers on open source policy. And every company uh, does that. Uh, it's, it's important to do that. I'm seeing Carlos in uh, Lederhosen and I'm thinking, oh, I'm, I'm excited for Oktoberfest. The third uh, aspect, and, and sometimes these can happen in parallel, is community education. Um, the OSPOs kind of create collaboration inside the company and education inside the company, but they also make it clear that uh, we need to be a good citizen of open source in the external open source community. And we need to give back and we need to participate and we need to be a part of this bigger fabric and that we can't just consume and, and, and keep it inside the company. We need to be a harmonious part of you know, the external ecosystem. And in, that's where engagement starts. Um, companies um, go into the stage where they consume, they contribute back maybe patches, and then they start releasing projects. They need to start hosting projects. Uh, that benefit the world. Um, and then, you know, final piece and throughout this should be uh, that you're strategically engaged, that you're advising the CTO, you are at the table on the company strategy, on the company um, business model, and that you are consulting with business units across the company on open source matters. And that truly is maturity when the business has a seat at the table for you as an OSPO leader and says, how should we approach this space? You know, should we consume open source? Should we uh, release something as open source? Is there a need for a standard in this space? How do we work in this space? And, and that is the important thing. And, and, and our intention always is to, you know, mature the whole organization to the point where we can be consultants and um, you know strategic advisors to the business, and and they just don't see us as a tactical and transactional organization that they come to uh, just before they go out uh, and release a product. And and the new challenge for open source um, organizations today is open source security, and that then becomes a very very core part of uh, the OSPO function. Because when you look at where we consume open source from, it comes not from one vendor, not from two vendors, it comes from thousands of projects. And every project is either big or small, it is uh, either very security aware or not security aware, has good practices, doesn't have good practices. So it's, it's all over the spectrum. And most open source maintainers focus on the technical problem solving. They're not creating an enterprise grade product with you know, security testing, pen testing, et cetera, et cetera. So they are purely solving a technical problem and they lack security training or focus. And many projects struggle with adequate resources. Maintainer burnout is very real. So you have projects with just one person or one or two, which the whole world is depending upon. And that is the supply side. 
And then when you look at the uh, demand side, you find, gosh, companies are using it for mission critical stuff and building you know, very, very important things which cannot afford to go down. And you know, as Stephen indicated, uh, Stephen Wally, uh, developers today are born in the age of open source. So they just take it for granted that it's there. You can just download it and use it. They don't really know the implications sometimes of licenses or the health of a community, et cetera. And so you have this dynamic of the supply side being very challenging and the demand side increasingly depending upon this type of a landscape. Uh, dependency management tools are inadequate. They don't tell you everything. And uh, frankly, all of us in companies are saying, how should we care for this? How should uh, our users in companies uh, work with upstream so that we can make sure that it's healthy and that it's secure when we consume it? that we can't abdicate that responsibility, right? We can't just be blind consumers. We need to be involved consumers. Um, I think I'm kind of running out of time. I will just quickly make a plug for the to-do group. Uh, they do an annual survey on OSPOs and the latest one is out. I have five minutes or? Yeah, oh, you, yeah you, you started, yeah, you've got a little over five minutes, yeah. Excellent. So they um, have a survey and I, it's very eye-opening. You may want to check this out and they've done it since 2016, 17, I think. And so you can see the history of how OSPOs have evolved and what the focus areas are of OSPOs today. Um, I, I'll end with saying that OSPOs really create a common language for all of us to talk together and work together on, uh, whether it's public sector or academia or uh, you know, nonprofits or corporate private interests, um, it creates a common language. And frankly, OSPO leaders are uh, brokers of relationships and communications and we are bridge builders. Uh, we build bridges inside companies, we build bridges to other organizations so that we can all learn from each other and collaborate more effectively. I am very excited that uh, institutions like the UCSC have an OSPO because you know who to talk to and then they help you navigate the entire scope of the university, right? And they say, okay, if you're looking for this, this is where you go. If you're looking for this, this is where you go. I, that's what I do. Uh, people come to me, uh, foundations, individuals, et cetera, and say, hey, Amazon is huge. Uh, can you help me navigate? I need to find the person who owns this or is using this or who can collaborate with me on this initiative. And I think we act as ombudsmen, ombudsmen and for compliance purposes also, frankly, uh, if there is an issue, most enforcers today will, will contact the OSPO and say in a very friendly way, I think you, they're not using it correctly. Can you do something about this before uh, they bring legal or other um, you know, uh, force to bear? So I am very, very excited that we have uh, something uh, like the uh, OSPO to create a common language for all of us to work together on. Ah, that's not part of the presentation. I was just trying to, I was just trying to visualize you know, all the different stakeholders we work with and navigate with. But thank you so much for the opportunity to share a little bit of the history and what we do. And it's very exciting to go to the Oktoberfest. But before that, uh, I'd love to hear from the Dean and thank you again. Yeah, I didn't see any in the chat, but I'll take a look. Um, oh. So there seems to be a reverse trend where all the high, like Amazon, Google, Azure, they're now selling proprietary closed source APIs mostly. So they seem to go the opposite way of open source. Hmm. Um, what do you think about that? So I, I am not educated on that enough to answer that question. Uh, 
I, I will have to talk to you uh, to understand that more. So if you go to app Amazon today, what, what you can buy is all these services, which are closed source. And, and, and Google and Azure does the same thing. Right, right. And, and I think, you know, most services, most product companies also sell closed source products, but based on open source, right? And it's probably to make it convenient for consumers mm. to use, right? And, but there are also open source projects that a lot of these companies put out, but more for collaboration versus, uh, you know, use in an enterprise or in you know, mission critical type of uh, function. So I, we will continue to see closed down open source. I, I don't think there'll be a, a pure open source world where everything is, is open source. Mm. Yeah, so thank you for the talk. Um, one, I'd be curious about an opinion. Um, and second, about what you think hospitals might do about this. So security is clearly a big issue. Uh, it seems to me that there are some signs, like the Department of Defense memo, which has the open by default statement, for example, that are arguing we need to be open. We understand their risk. We have to figure out mechanisms to deal with that. As compared to some other things like an OMB memo that came out that said any software produced by the federal government must have attestations that it's safe, it's probably impossible. Um, so, do you think the security conversation is sort of going to lead one way or the other, and can also help influence it moving that way? It's it's it feels like early days, um, and and I'm glad that OpenSSF is there to help us steer the course. Um, I know for a fact that one of the things that our OSPO really cares about is uh, knowing all of the open source we use and where it comes from and how we should establish a relationship with those uh, products so that we can uh, stay current on security and, and features and functions. Um, SPOM is still early days to me in terms of how to use it. Uh, how to get upstream to start producing it and for us to consume it and and for us to kind of share it. Um, so it's still early days, but the OSPO um, has a very important role to play in, I think, um, really emphasizing to the organization that you cannot uh, afford to not be involved. You need to work with upstream to, um, both contribute, but also be aware of what's happening uh, from a security and, and health perspective. I don't know if I answered your question, but yeah. Okay. Well, there are no more questions? All right, great. Thank you.